and welcome to Channels Book Club. My name is Olakule Kasumo, and it's always exciting to be on this show. Now, you would have observed that recently we've been focused on books on Nigerian history and politics. It's because we are in a serious political season in Nigeria. And of course, as far as history is concerned, we just can't get enough of it. Now, for those of you who love fiction, poetry, and other types of books, hang in there for us. We'll be right back on those. Now, this book I'm holding in my hand is The Nigerian Revolution and the Biafran War, the aftermath. Believe me when I say this is one of the most important books ever written on the Biafra War. Now, the man who wrote this book is Alexander Madiebo. Alexander Madiebo, unfortunately, passed away not too long ago. He was a prominent figure, not just during the war, when he led the Biafran army, but also before the war. And in this book, you will find very important narratives on the first coup, the second coup, and the many other events that led to the very tragic Biafran war. Now, we were with him just before he passed on. He, was, he had just turned 90 by then. He was frail. But it was exciting being with him and listening to him speak about his book, his passion. And also, his grandson read from his book. Enjoy this. Major General Alexander Madiebo was a former Nigerian Army officer, ADC to Namdi Azikiwe, the then Governor General of Nigeria and Chief of Staff of the defunct Biafran Army. In 1967, when the Civil War broke out, Major General Madiebo became the commander of Biafra's 51 Brigade and the Biafran leader, Chukwemeka Odimego Juku, later promoted him as a general officer commanding the entire Biafran Army a position he held until the war ended in 1970. Major General Madiebo was the author of one of the most famous books on Biafra war history, The Nigerian Revolution and the Biafran War, The Aftermath. He recently passed away at the age of 90 on the 3rd of June, 2022. I am Major General Madiebo. Commander of the Biafran Army. I commanded the army on the first day to 24 hours before the end. So many things, but briefly, I had to write the book because I was and still in the main source of information about the Biafran Army. There was no other commander even from the day. So immediately after the war, I started writing my book about a week after the end of So I had the of uh, who was was about the the old one, in order to continue the copy and without organization, and I get more from the end of the uh, war, where I sought to hang the book and then in I focus. Because uh, in the departure of a Jew was in no way the end of the affair. After the departure, 
Ja, voll geil. Aber voll Mons. Auch wenn ich I wrote it as an English trip paper. A new trip paper, he, he said the reasons why you have to find. Then you prepare the fortune and drawing of missions from this factor. I mentioned all that, and then also I overemphasized the fact that Nigeria was too embarrassed to be of any sure of surviving for the end of life. I believe that we can do better. If only we sacrifice a, a, bit, a bit. My name is Soshikaima Alexander Madibu. I am 15 years old and I am a student in SS2. I am the grandson of General Alexander Madibu, and I will be reading his book, The Nigerian Revolution and the Biafran War. Um, even though I'm a science student, I have keen interest in history, and this book proves to impact my knowledge in the Nigerian history and also the Biafran War. I will be reading from page 383, and it says, the aftermath covers the Biafran story after the departure of the Biafran peace mission to the Ivory Coast on the 11th of January, 1970. In the absence of the head of state and the Biafran army commander, the Biafran army continued to fight under General Philip F. Young until the 12th of January, when he opted for a peaceful settlement. What transpired in Biafra in those two turbulent days under General F. Young I get to be fully narrated, and an attempt is made here to do so briefly. Also, in the Ivory Coast, the Biafran Peace Mission operated as a government in exile with the primary aim of establishing an alternative Biafra in Angola. It failed to achieve that objective for many reasons, which led to the final death of Biafra on the 26th of May, 1970. Having been killed, by the I before other syndrome, evils. For the Biafran story to be complete, the aspect of it has to be told. Despite the federal government's declaration of its no victor, no vanquished policy at the end of the war, her implementation tactics of reconciliation, reconstruction, and rehabilitation were hardly ever executed. As a result, the evils has continued to suffer a high degree of political, economic, and social marginalization since the end of the war. That byproduct of the civil war is examined here with suggestions on how to improve this pathetic situation. However, with the recent reversals of the Biafran soldiers to dismissal to retirement, the atmosphere of desperation that beclouded the destiny of the Igbo nation is gradually giving way to a silhouette of hope in the distant horizon. It is hoped that the Nigerian government regard that gesture as the start line of an assault on evil marginalization. 
so that before long, the Igbos will be fully integrated into Nigeria as equal citizens with other tribes. That will certainly be the day. Joining us today to talk about Alexander Madiebo and his seminal work, The Nigerian Revolution and the Biafran War, The Aftermath, are two gentlemen that I like to say are two of the most brilliant historians that I've had the privilege of meeting and knowing. Now let's get to meet with them and then dig into the conversation on General Madiebo's book. Gentlemen, it's great to have you on Channel's Book Club. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. It's an honor having both of you. Uh, I, you know, I, I think you are two of the most um, brilliant historians I've met personally. <laughs> now, I'm not flattering you. That's true. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's very kind of I'm you. I'm the only one not wearing red cap here. What's happening? When you become a chief, <laughs> you might get one. <laughs> And only then. <laughs> only then. <laughs> okay, I'll walk towards getting one. <laughs> okay, um, now, <clears throat> Alexander Madebo, unfortunately, he passed on recently. Um, great man he was. But I, I, I get the sense that a lot of people in Nigeria, especially young people, don't know who he was. Um, so I think let's start by 
placing him in history. Um, why do we place him in history, Nigerian history? Well, I think it's uh, the, the easiest way to say, to describe him is that he was one of the first generation of Nigerian army officers. Uh, he was commissioned into the Nigerian army in December 1956. At the same time um, as Yakubu Gowon and Patrick Anwuna and Michael Kwechime um, and Arthur Negbe, there, there were five of them who were commissioned on the same day. Um, so that is that is his vintage, um, one of the first generations. I mean, if we stop and think that the first Nigerian officer was commissioned in 1948, mm -hmm. and uh, General Madiebo was was commissioned eight years after that in 1956, then he was one of the early lot. Um, and, and certainly one of the first uh, dozen or so to be commissioned from the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst, um, which is where he, he was commissioned as an officer. Hmm. Yeah. And um, we also, if we go into, if we drill down deeper, you know, he was an artillery officer. He was probably the first, you know, to head the artillery corps in the Nigerian army. So he was, he was a specialist, you know, yeah. and a highly proficient specialist. Now, if we now go further down the chronological uh, line, you know, he, his primacy as a head, basically, effectively, the head of the Biafran army, as it's, you know, it's, uh, so eventually, you know, um, places him in a very important position, a vantage in Nigeria's military historiography, not just the history, but the historiography, in the sense that he's, you can actually expect that he's an account from him of events at the time you know, uh, ex as the general actually um, uh, expressed earlier, uh, regardless of whatever questions we may have about one or two items on his, in, within his uh, 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 magnum opus, this, this book, The uh, Nigerian Revolution uh, and, the Niger and the Biafran War, you have to say that it is an invaluable, it's actually a crucial, crucial landmark in the historiography of not just Nigerian, the Nigerian military, but uh, the Nigerian, Nigerian political history. You know, mm. to the extent that Nigerian military were an important factor or stakeholder in the political process, an invaluable addition. So that's his, that's his, that's his importance. Yeah, mm. Now, I mean, we'll talk more about that. But before then, his book, The Nigerian Revolution and the Biafran War, The Aftermath, there was one before this edition without that rider there. Um, I think the first release was in 1980. Um, how important is this book when, when we are discussing the history of modern Nigeria um, post-1960, of course? Uh, he did say a lot of things prior to 1960, but most of the things here were after 1960 into the Biafra War. Uh, how do we, where do we place this book? How important is this work? Well, I, I think it's a valuable contribution to the body of literature. Um, as uh, has been alluded to, one doesn't necessarily have to agree with every um, opinion advanced in it. One may not even accept um, that everything is it is entirely factual. But then, which book can say that? No mm -hmm. book can say that. Mm -hmm. um, it is a valuable uh, uh, addition to to the uh, uh, as as Ed says the historiography and. I like to kind of describe these sort of things using the analogy of a jigsaw puzzle. If you pick one piece of a jigsaw puzzle, it's very difficult to actually work out what the picture says, but it's when you amass all the pieces of the jigsaw and arrange them in the right order that a picture emerges. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have sufficient numbers of the pieces of that puzzle, your picture will always be incomplete. This is a vital part of that jigsaw puzzle. Um, and I think, you know, it, it is... Um, it is to be commended. The other thing I would say is that um, having had the opportunity um, to, to speak with, with General Madia but shortly before he passed on, he made a very interesting comment, um, which I think needs to be reflected here. He attributed the accuracy of his recall to the fact that he kept a diary. Mm -hmm. And he said that he acquired that habit of keeping a diary from his next door neighbor at Victory Company at Sandhurst, happens to be a young man called Yakubu Gowon. Oh my. So he attributes <laughs> his habit of keeping a diary and therefore attention to detail and recall to the man who was his principal adversary mm. in, the, in the Nigerian Civil War, who had been his next door neighbor. There, actually, I think it's just a very brief synopsis 
of Nigeria's history. Mm. All the intersections. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, I mean, there, there are, oh my, there's so many things in here. Uh, yeah. you, want, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I want to speak about, because you, you, um, you, you asked a question about, you know, the, this edition. Yes. The book, this is the second yeah. edition. Um, I just want to give a bit of uh, personal insight as to why this came about. The reality is that, you know, um, may his soul rest in peace, uh, Dr. Arthur Wanko, his fourth dimension publishers had indeed been responsible for publishing the first edition of the book. That's a more widely known mm -hmm. uh, a version. Um, but I, it does appear that there was a dispute. And I, I, I do not think there's, it's not, it's, it's in the public domain, that there was a dispute with, uh, between uh, the, the, the late general and uh, Arthur Wanko in terms of uh, returns from the first one. So this was more about one, claiming for the family, as far as I know, claiming ownership, that's that both the uh, General Malibu and the family, claiming ownership of the work itself and making sure it actually uh, reached the public directly. Uh, secondly, um, he had insights that obviously had been gathered 41 years after, after the first book, which after. needed to be included. It wasn't a huge amount of text, but it was actually very extremely potent. Extremely. You know, and it gave a lot of insight. You know, you could, you could almost see that the benefit of, should I say, age, you know, the, the fires of youth, not, I, mean, I think youth is actually is, is, is the wrong term to use, but the, but the benefit of age reflected in the more nuanced approaches he took. The book is very objectively written, generally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the most honest approaches, as uh, General has said, I mean, the reality is that which book is perfect? Mm -hmm. a, book, a book, a biography, a, a biography will always reflect the personality and yeah. nuances yeah. of its writer. It, it, it can never really be objective, mm -hmm. but he made a very honest attempt. Yeah. But in the second part, you know, you can almost see him going, sitting back and thinking, you know what, I'm an elder. You, got, you, and you I almost feel just, an old wise man. Absolutely. Right, yeah. right and even that. though there might still be one or two things mm -hmm. that, you know, may not be, everyone might not agree with, and that's fair, but it was a very mature, very, balanced approach to the issues and it was also a very also uh, once again a very honest approach to the issues enjoyed that we had a lot to discuss but very little time but don't you worry we'll be continuing that interview next week so you may want to look out for that we'll be very delighted to get your feedback through any of our social media platforms displayed on your screen my name is Ola Kunle Kasumu remember one great book can change your life bye-bye <music>